Voila. <coughs> That's done. We thought we'd talk about some bone antler carving today. Once upon a time, <laughs> my favorite. Today we're going to show you how to turn deer tine into a gnome. All right, so first thing, of course, we have to do is detach the tine. So I'm going to saw it off right about where my thumb is, and that's unfortunately going to probably move us. So... <laughs> Because saying the first thing we want to do is cut the tine off of this antler. And well, it's always good. One of the most important tools I'll say again and again and again, pencil. <laughs> it's good to get yourself a battle plan with a pencil. That way it'll stand straight up, hopefully, when I'm done. So I'm going to cut it, cut this tine off and I'm using a little hacksaw blade. I've got a bandsaw blade, but I mean a bandsaw, but not everybody has a bandsaw at their disposal, but it's not too hard to come by a hacksaw. This being a very small one, they have bigger hacksaws, which cut, cut them even faster, but this will do. The magic of editing, you don't have to watch the whole process. <laughs> <clears throat> Guess I could have edited out the bands. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we will. Yeah. And there we go. Uh, uh, do -do -do. There we got our got our tine separated, and with a little adjustment, it'll stand up. But another really important tool. My toolbox, glasses. So, over the years, actually pretty early on, I discovered these flex shaft tools. And I guess the most more common name people are familiar with is Dremel. And Dremel is a good company and they make a good tool, but they're kind of almost a little light duty for what I do. But the, the bigger, like Fordham and, and different companies make more of an industrial strength machine and i've been using this thing for so long i hard pressed without it it's amazing what you can do with these tools anyway my workstation here is is kind of neat for this business because i've got a, a fan here that sucks the dust out i've got a little glass shield this protects my face and my eyes from chips and things coming up so between those two things it's pretty safe bone dust is not something that you want to breathe a lot of because it gets in your lungs and and cakes up and does nasty things uh, you might have heard of black lung they call it white lung it's not good so i avoid that with this fan and i'm gonna use a disc sander that works off the flex shaft with a fairly aggressive paper just to trim up the base and make sure she'll stand properly. And then uh, we'll put in some different bits and start carving. The moment it's gonna get noisy. <clears throat> That's got it standing up pretty good, not too tippy. It'll tip over, but not too bad. So now we go back to the pencil and I kind of divide it off to where I'll have the hat come down here because he's gonna have a really tall hat for a little fella. My first consideration. And then I'm going to do his beard. These are just little reminders for me so I don't forget to leave a space for anything like his nose. Mm -hmm. This guy, uh, I'm gonna have his hands behind his, folded behind his back because it's kind of a cute position. So like I said, it's just a little reminder marks to keep me on track. And I'm not sure if that shows up or not, but I'm moving around a little bit. You can see some lines. All right, so I'm going to be taking the sanding disc out and I'll put this in. This is a very cool tool. It's got three blades that twist down to a point. It was longer when I first got it but things happen. It broke. Sometimes these ha this particular model has a hole that goes right through the shaft of the handpiece and it allows me... I've had this one. I got to get a new one. <laughs> had this one so long that it's starting to wear out. So 
I have to do little tricks to get it tight. And I have a, a several others, other hand pieces that work real well. And what's nice is you just and switch over and you got another different bit already mounted up. Helps if it's spinning for alignment, getting the shaft in the little slot. Because this is a fairly small carving, I'm gonna start right in with this tool here and rough out with it. And you'll see it come to life. More lines. <laughs> Good to know where the feet are before you start. <laughs> Just about done with it. We got, the, got it roughed out where, at least I know where everything's supposed to be. A couple more minutes on this tool. I like to take off as much of the bulky stuff with this thing as I can. All right, so I'm gonna change over this one's, this is kind of a funny thing because this is the tool I use the most, especially for detail, and they don't sell them. Perhaps because you don't, you can make them so easy. I was going to mention that this one being the same as that, but it has this twist. You have to be really, really careful when you're piercing through something, like drilling a hole through. You don't want to really do it with this one because it'll be going fine. And as soon as this tip, finds air on the other side, it, it grabs like a, like a screw and, and binds up in whatever you're carving. And one or two things is gonna happen. Either the piece that you're drilling through will break loose and, and be ruined, or, or you'll jam it and the shaft will stop turning, but the motor won't. So you end up with a broken tool and that's no good so but this one here does the same type of job as but a finer detail and because the sides are straight not twisted you don't have to worry about that piercing problem you can drill right through with this and, and it's never a problem this guy that used to carve in a little tiny room and he had all the windows and all the doors like taped and covered with plastic so no dust would get in the rest of his house. But he'd be in there smoking cigarettes and using bandsaw and cutting and he didn't have a vacuum. It was just like London. <laughs> you know, yeah. Fog. yeah. This tool was powered through a rheostat on the floor. A foot pedal. Oh, is that how you used to call it? Yeah. There is a grain to antler that you have to kind of play by the rules that way, but with a sharp bit and a, at a high speed, work against it a little bit and it doesn't react too badly. Don't want him to look like an angry little gnome. Now it's time to use the pencil again. Okay, let me shut this off for a second. Yeah, I think I can shut this fan off now. It does stand. <laughs> I try to avoid is this is called the chuck or call it and um, it's spinning as fast as this is I, I try not to let this make contact with the bone Be, uh, like uh, oh <laughs> all of a sudden you smell burning bone <laughs> Ow, that's no good trick to these little boogers is to only take as much as you need off in order to fit him into the tine. I try to take as little as possible. Right now, just about at the point where I can put away the power tools and 
use some chisels and so forth. That looks like a little gnome. <laughs> <laughs> a little gnome. I'll go back to the power tools for doing like the hair and stuff like that. And I did want to mention too, talking a lot about moose antler and everything. Deer antler works good too, but moose antler has a whole lot more solid material to utilize than deer. The tines are pretty good at this point, you know, that, that close to the end they get pretty solid, but the main beam on a deer antler, where did that one go here? You know, this part of the deer antler is kind of porous. You know, it's got like a honeycomb thing going on in the center. So it's not real solid. On the base, this part of the antler, it is solid. You can see it where it's cut off right there, that that's solid. And that goes up for a little ways before it starts getting kind of hollowish or honeycomb and that varies i mean it's they're not all like that they do vary some are more solid than than others this one actually does seem to be a fairly solid example but i've had some that were like holy mackerel <laughs> there's air pockets in there that's kind of like detrimental to carving so we're going into the hand tools now a, a flat chisel is a real staple in my repertoire of tools these through use and so forth have become magnetized they pick up steel wool and that sort of thing and so you, you can either just brush them off like that but you only get a certain percentage but if you go like this snap them against something it all falls off so i do that a lot so don't be alarmed when i do <laughs> so these are three different sizes that i have going on here I made them a long time ago and they've been worked a lot they work really well and like I've mentioned in past shows that I make my tools out of the best steel I can get my hands on. And when I break a jeweler's file or something like that, I don't throw it away. <laughs> These are all made out of jeweler's files. Probably most of the ones that I've made with, that you'll see with bone or antler handles were once a jeweler's file. Now, I do have also a variety of these huh? dental tools that have been reshaped and sharpened for different purposes. I'll be going through different tools and I'll try to mention what I like about each of them as I go. But I'm going to start with the, a straight chisel, flat chisel to outline the belt. This cuts a nice straight edge around the belt line. Stop here. I've left a, enough material so that I can give the little guy a knife. Very important, living in the woods, as they do. The knife is defined enough at this point that there's not much chance of me accidentally carving it away. You can probably see the little knife forming up. I like to take the, the outer patina off of the carving completely below the hat. But the hat, I leave... Yeah, so the knife is getting defined. This is a new tool for me. I finally put a uh, handle on it. And it, too, is a jeweler's file. And like the uh, bit that spins, it's just a triangular blade that goes down to a point. Each edge is quite sharp. Because it's got such a, you know, it's, it's triangular. You know, uh, there it is. Triangular. So the corners are sharp enough to scrape and cut bone, but they're also sturdy enough not to chip. You know, if you had a blade that had a really acute angle on it and you're cutting on bone, they tend to chip out. Of these three flat chisels, straight chisels, this, the littlest one, is the one I like the best. And I think it's because it has such a small cutting edge that your efforts are magnified. You know, you get more pounds per square, whatever that would be. <laughs> it's not an inch per square, tiny bit. So I'm just going to make the top of the sheath. The knife goes in. Well, anyway, you can kind of see the, uh, if I get this light just right, like that maybe. Mm. The knife shows up pretty good there. 
pretty well defined. I suppose I'll do the the buckle now. I think I will use that. Scribe it out. There, I've got this little bag. I think I'll I'm gonna define a lid on his bag with this. This is a, a burn, which is it again triangular in, in shape, but the difference is that the end on this is cut squarely off or maybe tip back a little bit to give me sharp cutting edges along the front here. These corners are very sharp and they're great for laying down a straight line and they're very aggressive. They dig in. And then this, I can go and cut to it. Defines the lid of his pouch. See, this is great for um, planishing off carving marks from the machine, smoothing it down. Now that his upper tunic belly area is pretty well good. I'm going to undercut a little more under the belt on the bottom part. I got another tool here that's uh, started out as a dental tool. If I can get my fingers on it. So all it is is a round shank that I've cut off and ground at an angle. And I can use it like the burn, but now I've got a, a curve, like a gouge, instead of a V tool. And I can clean up the, the pleats on his tunic below the belt. Another dental tool here that I've reshaped into what looks to me a bit like a squirrel's claw. It's flat on the inside of the curve here, and I use that for drawing towards me, and it cuts great on under and behind things. The beard's pretty well defined. I use this little round ended one to do around the eyes. The other end of this has got a nice tool too. It's for scraping towards you, but it's all, it's round, so it's good for dishing things out, cleaning out inside contours. A favorite around noses. I'm just going to kind of dress up his little shoes here. So I've cut around the, the his little sabots and under his tunic a little bit, sharpened that up. And most of the detail beyond that we had already done. So this is where I've got to bring on some more. Optics, <laughs> old eyes, old eyes. So I'm gonna do the hair here. What I put in, it's a little burr dental tool. It's kind of, well, let me draw a picture because it's really, really small. I call it a bucket shape because it kind of looks like a bucket. Kind of looks like that, or would this be the better camera? This being your cutting edge, it's an acute angle. So it, if I use it, into a piece of material like that, it cuts a nice deep line and it's very, very small, which is perfect for what I'm doing right here. So I'm gonna cut it, cut the hair in on his beard and open his eyes. All right, so we've got all the hair and his beard cut in, and I used the same tool to open up his eyes a bit, but then I've gone in with my little scribe here, which is like a knife for this kind of work, and was able to really detail the, the eyes, outline them really nice. So what I'm gonna do 
has put his pupils in with this tool. Don't watch, this could be painful. Yeah, my eyes. Yeah. But it just. And we got little pupils in his eyes now, and basically pretty much there. Oh, yeah, I can see his eyes. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dip it in some. In my dye, my stain, which I make out of walnut or butternut husks. So. Here I have another mason jar. <laughs> this has a stain in it. Am I still talking to camera? Yep. <laughs> just talking. I'm just talking for myself. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> She's acting like he's performing or something. Anyway, this is the husks from walnut shells. You know, the, the walnuts are, they come about that big, and then you take off the shell and then the nut hard parts about that big well this outer part if you boil it in water you'll end up with this really really nice stain uh, this is a fairly diluted mixture here so it doesn't stain it dark but what it does do is brings up the details and what i do is let that dry and um, dip it again <clears throat> And then we steel wool it back down and it'll bring up the highlights and leave the pigment in the in the lines and cracks and grooves and crevices and things. Oh, you left footprints on my table. <laughs> As this starts to dry and you rub it around a little bit, it really gets into the grooves. Get into the groove, man. Quick dunk. That one looks like it did more. That's all I need of that. So here we are. The stain has dried enough to where I'm going to steel wool it down. That'll bring the highlights up. I like to use 4 aught and that's a crappy piece. I'm going to be right back. 4 aught steel wool. It's <clears throat> the finest steel wool that I've got. It doesn't distort the details, but it um, polishes bone up really nice. You want to just move the trash can? <laughs> yeah. Orange peelings. <laughs> <laughs> you can see on the face the uh, the bone is mm -hmm. highlighted and it leaves the shadows mm -hmm. in there. Just kind of put all the detail into something like this. You want it to chill. And this gives it a kind of a patina like you'd get if this thing was a hundred years old or something, but who's got a hundred years to wait around? <laughs> oh. A wee, a wee brush. A wee brush. Clean the steel wool out. The cracks and crevices. And voila. <clears throat> That's done. Yeah. If we remember where he used to live. Huh. <clears throat> Once upon a time. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not sure. Maybe it was like that. <laughs> but at any rate, he did used to live on this antler. <laughs>